far with Romans 9, 10, and 11. To be honest with you, a lot of Christians are not that familiar with that portion of Romans. They kind of kind of know the basic thought, but they're not, you know, they're not that much in tune with what it's talking about. But basically what it is, um, what it is talking about up to that point is the progression or the pattern that we've been talking about in relationship to the Day of Atonement that we've been talking to in relationship to the captivity. And we have been told that Romans is the same pattern for these two areas in the, in the Bible. <clears throat> I believe that the scriptures we are going to read are sort of a jubilation from the Apostle Paul over the first 11 chapters up to this, this is the last few verses of, uh, it be, we'll be reading 33 through 36, um, a jubilation over that pattern, a jubilation over that pattern that Romans sets forth that, um, and in Romans 9, 10, 11, he also deals a lot with the captivity and scriptures pertaining to the captivity. <clears throat> and so there is this awe. There is this awe that he is having in the midst of sharing this incredible reality of the Lord. So Romans 11, we'll start with verse 33 to the end of the chapter. <clears throat> Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Who hath known the mind of the Lord, or hath been his counselor? Or who hath first given to him, and it shall be, and it shall be recompensed unto him again? For of him... And through him and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. And everybody said, because that's the last word in that verse. <clears throat> um, this is, uh, and, and maybe we're not quite ready to jubilate the way Paul is here to to. to I mean, I mean, he's writing these things. He's writing this to the church at Rome. He's writing these things, and all of a sudden, it is so powerful to him and so glorious to him that he just goes off. You know, I mean, I can see somebody writing and then go, oh, man, praise God. But he goes, you know, he's writing, and then he goes, oh, the riches of the glory of the, you know, and he just goes ahead and writes it down because it's just so powerful to him. And, and he's talking about the depth of riches and how unsearchable his ways are. They're past finding out based on this, for who hath known the mind of the Lord? See, it's, he's not saying this stuff's so hidden that God will never show it to you. He's not saying, um, oh, how, how high or how deep or whatever this is, and therefore, um, you know, most of us will never get it. He refers this to the mind of Christ. Okay. Now, you know, I'm sure you know this. There are not a whole lot of scriptures that really talk about the mind of Christ. There are several, but they're not a whole lot. So to draw from that, you're going to have to um, consider some of the others, such as Philippians 2, what, 5. Let this mind, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being God, 
didn't think that it was necessary to fight for his rights as God. But he gave it up, became as a man, as a man became a servant, and as a servant became as a criminal that was crucified. For what reason? For others. For, and when we say that, when we say that, we don't just mean do stuff for others. We don't just mean like, there is a Christian concept that we all should embrace. We should do stuff for others. You know, it's about the mind of Christ being in you. Amen. Do you see that? It, this is more than rules and commandments. The commandments are over with on that front in the, in the sense that now that the old covenant was written on tables of stone. The new covenant's written on our heart. But see, we go, yeah, he, puts, he wrote stuff on my, my Well, No, it is this reality of Christ in you, the hope of glory. It is this reality of his mind being in you. And folks, there's almost no, no worth, and, and you know, here I go, so people get upset. There's almost no worth in Christ being in you if his mind isn't in you because then he's just sitting in a little room, hopefully you got a little table and a light so he can, you know, something in there because he's not doing much. You see what I'm saying? I mean, he's not doing much. You're doing all the living, and it's not very pretty. And he's just kind of sitting in there waiting for us to go, hey, Jesus, I need help, you know, when finally something goes bad. Jesus, I need help. The bad thing is we don't even look to Jesus in us. You know, when we say, Jesus, I need help, we look up. But... The hope of glory is Christ in you, and it is his life, and it is his nature, and it is his spirit, and it is who he is, not just what he does. Oh, Jesus makes me more loving towards people. No, he doesn't. He, God is love, and you're not. Okay? And if you don't believe me, just try loving somebody you don't like and see how that goes. I mean, it'll go good for a while until they look at you funny or do something that you don't like or just come into the room. <laughs> Why is everybody looking at me? <laughs> oh, yeah, because I'm teaching. <laughs> so, so he's referring this incredible thing that's overpowering to him and overwhelming and an incredibly awe-inspiring, all of it coming from the mind of Christ. And he's saying, you know, after sharing all this stuff all the way from chapter 1 through 9, 10, and 11, <coughs> Who has really understood? Who's really known his mind of selfless giving and of, and, and of not, you know. All right. God's way of being selfless is not our way. You say, but if it's, if it's sacrificial, it's okay. No, if it's Christ living in you, if it's his spirit if it's his nature, but I said his, his selflessness is not ours. Let's, let's give an example. <clears throat> okay. Jesus sitting on a throne in heaven, and he looks down at the earth and he goes, Oh, the sin and all oh, these poor people and the pain and the agony. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sprinkle you know, really happy stuff to them, but not every moment because, as we know, nobody's got it every moment. So I'm just, I'm going to do it randomly from time to time so you don't get totally discouraged. Or let's put ourselves in a situation where we drive into the ghetto in our limo, the, the chauffeur opens the door for us, and we pass out $20 bills to the poor people. 
And, and maybe that guy goes back to church and tells everybody, and they go, oh, how selfless. Okay. That's our kind of selflessness, one that really doesn't cost us. Why do you think Jesus was so impressed with the widow giving the widow's mite? He went, she's not giving out of her abundance. She's actually losing because this is all she's got. She had given all her substance. Jesus was impressed with that. Was she the only one putting money in the offering that day? See, we say any offering is a good offering. No, it's not. You say, brother, aren't you a pastor? Shouldn't you be encouraging people just to throw money in the... No, Jesus didn't. Jesus only commented on her and sort of gave the impression that everyone else that seemed to be giving was giving out of abundance because they, that was their term, selflessness. I have plenty, so I'm going to give... And that's what makes me selfless. But Jesus had plenty, came down, as I said, from that scripture, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who didn't think sitting on a throne and functioning gloriously as God was something to be grasped after. That's the original Greek in those scriptures. He didn't think those things were something to be grasped after, but let him go, came down, became as a man, and as a man, see, I love the way that verse is. And as a man, am I talking too fast? I forgot your translator. And as a man. <laughs> you know, I started by reading scriptures where Paul's excited, so I can't help but be excited for him. <laughs> but as a man, then he didn't go, I have, I have really become selfless now. I was God, and now I'm a man. But he could, have, he could have come down here as a royal man, or the best man, or the best position. You understand? I mean, he, he could have. Uh, a, an honored man. A noble man. He, you know, they said when they heard good stuff coming out of Jesus' mouth, they said, wait a minute, isn't this the carpenter's son? They weren't, in other words, this sounds really good, but you know, we should hear this from somebody that really knows good stuff, somebody who's been trained, somebody that's acceptable in our sight. And then as a man, the Bible says he humbled himself. I mean, he emptied himself. That's the exact word, kenosis, in, in Greek, kenosis. He emptied himself of, of that right to be God and function as God and have all the blessings that are due to God and became a man. But then when he became a man, he looked around and instead of promoting himself, he humbled himself and became as a servant. Remember when the Last Supper and he was fixing to die. Excuse me, he was about to die. Excuse my Texan. He was fixing to die. And he got down and the scripture says And Jesus, knowing that all things had been given unto him and what had been given unto him with these guys that he was having the meal with, and they were going to be everything when he died and left and arose, and they were going to carry forth. So, so he, what does he do to them? Stand over them and say, well, brothers, let me tell you something. I'm the big boss. And here's, no. he got down and washed his feet, washed their feet. And Peter's going, no, don't wash my feet. And Jesus is saying, you don't really know what this is about yet, do you? And he didn't, you know. You say, well, it took him long enough. Well, it's kind of taken us a while. And apparently Paul thinks it's taken a while because he's going, who hath, for who hath known the mind of the Lord? Who really knows this spirit of Jesus?
I just returned from Houston, and uh, a brother asked me, and it reminded me of somebody, something somebody said to me when we first started a long time ago. He said, what would you do if somebody gave you a Lamborghini? I said, I'd sell it and use the money to spread the gospel of Christ around the world. And he laughed and he said, <laughs> he said, yeah, I can't see you pulling up going, rum, rum, yeah, I'm cool now. <laughs> Um, and maybe one day, you know what I mean? <laughs> or, or a week, you know what I mean? But, <clears throat> yeah, I couldn't afford the gas for a week, just run, run, or something. okay, that's my money. You know? I couldn't keep up the insurance on it, but... <clears throat> Anyway, Jesus, and then he, he becomes a man, and he humbles himself and becomes a servant, and then he becomes obedient. He empties himself, God becomes man. He humbles himself, man become, God man becomes servant. He becomes obedient unto death, empty, humble. And then obedience unto death. Not just obedience. Not just obedience. Obedient unto death. The scriptures are very clear on that point. Um, we're so busy trying to become obedient so that we won't have to die or suffer or lose. You know what I mean? I'll, oh, I'll be obedient. All right, but... But, and I didn't know I was going to take this long in these verses, but maybe this is uh, the Holy Spirit saving me from. <laughs> um, verse 35, or who hath given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again. The Lord is giving. He's about not receiving, but giving. He said, I came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give my life a ransom and so who hath given to him and you know it's not going to come back to them already this is the way the Lord is you can give to some people and you'll never hear nothing back but Jesus it's just the way he is and and what is this talking about oh the depth of the riches of the knowledge of him the the knowledge that is in the wisdom and the knowledge that is in the mind of Christ. The, the wisdom of God in a mystery. The wisdom of God in, in weakness. Who's known that mind? I'm not saying who's heard the, not heard the doctrine or heard teaching about that kind of way, or, but to know his mind? You're going to have to, I mean, I, you know, I know it's more than that, but I, I see Jesus at that Last Supper, and they're all 12 sitting there, and John leans over, you know. He leans over. Because, you know, to me, I just say he, he wants to know his heart. He doesn't just want to know the ritual going on, and it's more than ritual, but, I mean, the... It's more about the Lord here than it is the Lord up there. You know, it's, it's a pursuit of the Lord in a different way than just, you know, religiously, you know, trying to grab hold of whatever. You know what I mean? And I'm going to get this, and boy, I'm going to be deep. You're going to be something, but... Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, for you do this and you leave this off. You meant, you, you tithe out of your, even the smallest things that you grow, you tithe off of that. But you leave off justice and mercy. See? It's, it's not about, it's not about 
becoming far surpassing in religion. It's about entering into something that doesn't just come by book learning. You understand that's a Texas phrase there. By book learning. It doesn't come just by uh, trying to stuff things of, of a spiritual nature into our heads. And it is possible to read the Bible and quote it back to people. The Pharisees did it. Did you know that? The Pharisees had to have memorized the Pentateuch so they could, they could quote. Has Kelly been doing my classes again? Um, by the way, thank you for sending me the notes so I could preach this. I'd like to just publicly say that everything that I really seem to get from the Lord comes from Kelly. <laughs> She is my mentor. Oh, my God. <laughs> and I bless her every day. <laughs> well, if you can't take it, come down from your high perch up there, <laughs> overlooking the crowd and <laughs> overlooking your people. <laughs> All right, so, you know, who, who's really known? There's a question mark after that. Who really knows this kind of mind, the mind of the Lord, the Lord's mind in this way? Who really knows that? That's what he's saying. He's going, oh, the, I mean, he's, you should hear the things that he's just said in chapter 11. They are eternal. We think it's a, a book about being good to the Jews. Yeah, that's what we get out of it. Yeah, you know, we should be kind to animals and the Jews, you know what I mean? Something, well, you know, I mean, I'm not putting them in the same, I'm, what am I saying? I'm Jewish. <clears throat> but, but to really see not, you know, I don't know what we're thinking. We're, we're thinking, I'm going to read the Bible and one day, bam, I'm going to know stuff. Really? I mean, really, is that one day, bam, and I know stuff? Yeah, it doesn't work that well, does it? Whereas if you're, and I'm just using that picture that we were using, where there, whereas with that leaning spirit, there is that, that draw, I don't know. Anyway, you let the Holy Spirit tell you. All right, we'll go to verse... Um, 36, and here is the piece de resistance of these scriptures. For of him, thank you, Heater, for going down. May everything bow to him. For of him, and through him, and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. All right. So what he has discovered here, what he is, he's, he's, you know, jubilating about here is that he has seen something of the mind of the Lord in these things that he's written down or knew it before and wrote it down and just went, whoa, my Lord, the way that he is, the, the selflessness, the, the complete um, loss of any thought of trying to get something himself and yet to him and through him and of him is everything. Because Paul's saying, in other words, I can't be selfless like that. It's going to have to be him. It's going to have to come through him through me. I'm, I'm his branch. I'm his branch. How many of you on a daily basis think, you know, praise God, I'm saved, I'm a Christian, I'm da-da-da. Or a weekly basis, monthly basis. 
But how many of you think that often I'm his branch? I, I got nothing unless I'm abiding in him. I, all the things that God wants cannot come out of me unless I abide as his branch. So I, I cleave, you know, I cleave to that. Like I said, when I was a missionary in Jamaica for a couple of years, I was taking care of the <laughs> folks. You got to see the humor in this. Um, I went years and as a Bible school student was one of the first to really begin in my that class to see, you know, the Lord in this way in this manner. Um, was my sophomore year. The, the students voted me as the president of the student council above juniors and seniors, not because of me, but certainly they recognized that I was seeing something of the Lord. And so, the, so I graduate and the, the leadership comes to me and says, Randy, we'd like for you to become a missionary in you know, the mission field in Jamaica and not in one of the big cities, but in the, what's called the bush or the jungle. And... Uh, so, um, my story begins now. My responsibility, one of my responsibilities while being in this very out of the way place was to take care of the goats and the pigs. And I'm, I'm thinking, you know, of course I was just fresh out of Bible school in my early 20s. I'm thinking, Lord, couldn't you have come up with a little better scenario than this? You know, I mean, is this really, you know, what you think of how much I know? <laughs> and, and, and he said yes. And he was right. You know. Sometimes I wish I was 16 again. Then I knew everything, you know what I mean? <clears throat> All right, so I walked up, and this Jamaican guy was working on a tree over there, and I said, hey, what are you doing? I said, I said come on, what happened? Anyway, I spoke Patois. And he said, he said, well, I'm putting this, I, I'm grafting this, branch into this other tree and I knew that it was in the scripture but you know Carolyn and I were talking about this um, a lot of times city people know stuff country people don't and country people know stuff city people don't know and we if you're from the city you don't know a lot about grafting and I didn't so I said, can you show me how this is done well I asked him a little more so now why why would you graft and he said well he says, this, this tree over here is not producing good fruit. And he says, so I'm taking some of the branches off and I'm grafting it into this tree and the life of this tree is gonna come into that branch instead of the old life, because the old life will die out and it'll start bringing forth really good fruit. And I said, Woo, could you, could you demonstrate all this for me? You know, because you know the scriptures, but you don't know beans about the process, you know. And so he goes, sure. So he, he goes over and he cuts out a branch. All right. He cuts out, cuts you out of the old. He doesn't just go, please come follow me, branch. And it jumps off and goes, okay, you know. He cuts you out by the cross. And so the, the Jamaican brought it over to the tree that he was going to put it into. And you know what he did next? He cut a cross into that tree with his knife, past the bark and everything, 
and then he pulled it back and he took the new the branch and he stuck it in there and he worked it in there and he got it in there real good and then he pulled out kind of some cellophane stuff like saran wrap or something like that not the not the metal kind with the clear stuff um, and he wrapped it really good to hold it so that it would abide and I said is that it you know because he goes no mom I said what's left he says branch has to attach to the tree man the branch has to attach to the tree man so really it does everything you've done so far doesn't mean anything not unless it attached to the tree man so what do we do now we wait man we wait and we see if this branch catch. So I said, when are you going to come back to check on it? And he said, Thursday, two weeks from now. I said, can I show up and see if everything, you know, see how you do this and stuff? I, it was exciting for me. He goes, yes, mom. OK. So I wait. and. Two weeks later, he goes, okay, we check it, man. So he looks in, he, he kind of pulls back um, the wound. Remember the cross that he put into the, to the tree. He kind of pulls it back a little bit to see if it's really attaching to the wound. To the wound. And he says, look, man, it's catching. And I said, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> you, know, you know, he doesn't know Jesus, but he's going, you crazy religious American. Anyway, so, <clears throat> but it was, it was all inspiring to me. It was incredible. And I, obviously, I've never forgot it, and I never will forget it. And any time... I talk to anybody about grafting, I have to tell that story because all the talk from the scriptures can only be talk unless we see something that makes it come alive and the Holy Spirit breathed on all that for me. Somebody else might have been standing there, even a Christian and going, oh, that's cool. <laughs> I mean, for me, it wasn't just, well, that's cool. It was, it was like, whoa. All right, so, so if you're a branch of him and to him, what the fruit that's going to be coming out of you as a branch grafted in, it's not going to be to you. Yes. Yeah, it was only in the tree that the, the wound yeah, was yeah. cut. So that was significant to me this time you were telling you that story because the, the, the branch is grafted into the wound uh, on the tree. Not, it's not a cross that the branch right. goes through or bears. Well, interestingly enough, the branch was cut, but it was cut off. Right. And it wasn't cut off with a cross in the sense of like, like the wound yeah. was. And so by being cut off and then put into his side, as it were, we become grafted back in. And, and you know, I think that's the beautiful, I, Holy Spirit, you're something else. I, I just think that's the beautiful story of the, the original, first original marriage. Uh, it, there was no ceremony or whatever. It was God taking a rib, you know, putting a, a, a cut in his side, taking a rib out, he's bleeding, and 
forming, not from the dirt. Men, we might have been formed from dirt, but they're not. They're not. They're formed from him, and we're the, we're the bride of Christ also. But what I saw was kind of like what I shared this past Sunday, or was it this past? I don't remember. Man, there's so much. There's been so much. Um, that, you know, that, that uh, Pentecost was a reversal of the Tower of Babel. Well, truly becoming the bride of Christ is kind of a reversal of what happened to Adam now. In that, yes, Jesus was ruining everything, but now we are crafted back into him. And the New Testament says we're bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh, but not just an extension of him like we think of marriage. Because in him there is no marriage, there's only oneness. Somebody said to me once, well, if there's no marriage in heaven, am I not gonna be married to my wife and is somebody else gonna get her? And I said, probably, buddy, you're pretty messed up. No, 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 I didn't say that, I'm just joking. <clears throat> I'm fully capable of it, though. And I've said worse, even this week, even a couple of days ago. But anyway, <clears throat> crazy. Anyway, um, and I said, well, the scripture says there's no marriage and given in marriage. Oh, wait a minute. I'm sorry. There is one. It's called the Marriage Supper of the Lamb. And it's based on oneness. It's not based on documents. Not Jesus. Uh-uh. He's not near as religious as you think he is. He's real. And it's based on oneness with him and being grafted into him and finding out the truth by finding him as the truth. Glory to God. And so it's almost like that bride that was separate and an extension out over here in the New Testament, bam, he reopens his side. But this time we're joined into him and one with him. We're his body. We're the, you know, see, we're not just his rib, folks. We're his body. Ah, it's, you know, oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. For of him, and it's through him. It's, this whole thing is of him. And that mind, let me tell you something, that, see, of him doesn't mean anything unless you understand that it comes from that mind. It's not us coming up with religious things that we're trying to do for God. It is that which is of him, of his mind and heart, reaching through his body, us, reaching through, and, and using the branch again, and the fruit finally starts coming, real fruit, not us, you know, what I call difference between Christmas tree fruit and apple tree fruit. Christmas tree sparkles and tinsel and glistens, but it's dead. The tree is dead. And we go, oh, it's so lovely. It's dead. <laughs> you know, don't you love my Christmas year? It's dead. It looks alive. It can't bear any fruit. So you got to dress it up. Whereas apple tree fruit, that's a whole different ball game. That comes from what? Life. Life produces. Do you believe that? Yes. Jesus is the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Life produces. Life produces. For of him and through him, and it all comes back to him. It all does. And when, especially when it comes to the Godhead. 
Because if Jesus is the vine and we're the branches, the father is the husband. So it's all coming back that way. And he's coming and he's blessing and he's watering and he's taking care of the vine. And the vine says, what do you want from me? And he says, I want fruit. And he says, and he goes, you will have fruit through me. The vine says this, you will have fruit through me as you pour into me, as you pour water, the water of the word, as you fertilize, as you, you know, we go, oh, give me water, yes, oh, you know, like a, a, a cool, wonderful shower, you know, uh, but then he starts sticking fertilizer around your roots, you know, I'm, what's this for? It's just to help you grow. I don't think this is going to help me grow, you know, just, just throw rose petals around my, you know, around, and I'll, I'll grow, I'll give you all that you want. You know, that's us, that's not Jesus talking. Jesus says, you know, the cross is as necessary as the resurrection. And so that difference between Christmas tree fruit and apple tree fruit, we can see it, we can hear the concepts. But there's something that must happen to break us from the old tree with its old ways and its old roots and its old bugs that are <laughs> eating it and all the, all the things that's wrong with it, the root rot and everything else, which we call, you know, in many cases, sorry, Christianity. <laughs> you know, not that that's the true, you know, there is a true, but the true truth of Christianity is Christ in us and us in Christ. So, but, so it's hard to, you know, it is hard to cut us out of the old, at least in our understanding. Even if he does that, cuts us out, and we've already been grafted in, we're, we're in Christ, we're born again, we're joined, we're one. Still, that old thing remains our mentality and we still produce sour fruit. Not everybody, not all the time. But the condition of the church worldwide is not Jesus' fault as the vine, is it? The vine is, the vine is fine. <laughs> the vine is just fine. It's us. And the branches are just fine if Christ becomes more to us than just the Savior from, you know. We look at that tree over there, the one we were grafted out of, and, you know, the farmer, after he takes some branches out and grafts it into the good tree so that it'll bring forth good tree, goes and cuts it down and then starts a big fire. And that's the way they do it in Jamaica. They just have a big fire and they throw everything in there and burns up. And they've got a regular place um, that they burn everything. And so the branch, he just, he's in there and he hadn't really caught on to the life and his, um, you know, I'm going to, you know, he's not sucking in the life into himself. He's just kind of laying there and thank God for this band that's holding me. And he, but he looks over and he sees the fire pit and he sees the, the thing he was cut out of and he goes, oh, thank God I'm saved from hell. Okay, well, thank God. But he didn't, you know, if, if he just wanted to save you from hell, he'd go over to that bad tree, cut all the branches off, and go lay them in a pile over here and go, there, you're saved from hell. Now just lift your branches and rejoice. You know, the trees of the field will clap their hands. But, he, but, he, but we're grafted in. Do you not see the, I mean, I'm sure you do. But 
Do I not see this? We're grafted in so that he might bring forth fruit in us. I was thinking today, I was just walking along and I thought, let the spirit have his way. Love, joy, peace, gentleness, meekness, faith, long suffering. Usually if we say let the spirit have his way, we don't even think of those things. But that's the fruit of the spirit. It's not our fruit. So isn't that in the Bible? Yes. And wouldn't the spirit be more pleased to please Jesus than to please us? And wouldn't he be more pleased to go ahead and please us with Jesus? Forming that we might be conformed to the image of Christ. That's what the scriptures say. It doesn't say that we might be conformed to the Christian religion. What time is it? Let me just make sure the Holy Spirit's finished. If he even started, some of you are going, well, I never saw him. <laughs> For of him and through him and to him are all things. To whom be glory forever. So be it. Amen. Why don't we just do a quick prayer and then we'll take a break. Father, thank you for the Spirit of God who feeds us Christ, who, who sees to it that uh, our growth is not just learning Christian truths, but we grow up into him, into Jesus, in all things, who is the head. Thank you that the Holy Spirit never gets off track. He never, his heart is never swayed, even though we pull him into so many things, his heart is never swayed, and he waits, and he waits, and he waits for us to open to him in the ways that he feels is his mission down here. So Holy Spirit, we say we're sorry and we want you, we want you to reveal Christ in us. We want Christ crucified, that reality as our mind. And we, we want you to find rest and contentment in being able to carry out the things that are dearest to your heart. For we ask in Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's take a, a 10, 15.